please open your Bibles to Revelation chapter 2, verse 18 through 29. This is the fourth of the letters we are studying. And this one to the church at Thyatira and Southside. And all other churches that belong to the Lord. This letter has been read and we will study it together so let's pray father we bless you for the wondrous story of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and father we want to bless you for the letters that you have especially written Lord Jesus to all of your churches and they're pretty strong and we need your grace to receive them with welcome arms and heart. Give us revelation and understanding as to how you would apply these scriptures to our hearts today. Accomplish your good purpose in every person present. And we bless you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. As Mel read this letter earlier, I wonder if any of us had any thought of, wow, this is pretty strong stuff. <coughs> Written to a church. If they don't repent, they're going to have great tribulation. I will kill her children with death. All the churches shall know that I am he which searches the reins and the heart. He had not read how to win friends and influence people. If you're familiar with that book. It tells you how to speak in a very pleasing way and not to disturb people. Make them your best friend. But this is a, this is a letter of love. Make no mistake about it. When we open the word of God, we don't find sugarcoating. We don't find uh, just sort of hitting around the edges. God goes right for the heart. When you open the word of God, we need to see the big picture. And surely we would be quick to confess that God is patient. That God is kind. God is loving. God is never unjust. And thankfully, God has a habit of not ever being fair. Fair is justice for all, which means hell for all. That's what we deserve. For we have all sinned and come short of the glory of God. I, I don't want God to be fair. He's not going to be unjust. He's not going to be unfair. He has a strong habit of being merciful. Amen. And loving. And gracious. You say, well, everybody deserves a chance. No one deserves a chance. For we have all sinned and we have earned the right to heaven. No, to hell. <laughs> Said that one wrong. We have earned the right to justice. We need God's mercy and grace. Well, I'm thankful again that God is not only a God of justice, but he is a God of mercy and love and grace to the undeserving but not at the expense of his holiness or his justice. Now, when we open the word of God at any portion, and when we open a letter like this, God is speaking. Now, unfortunately, we have to explain that in this generation. There are both men and women who stand and teach and preach 
and they are fond of talking about how God has told them something. God is speaking. As a lady, you can't go into a bookstore without finding books and tapes by Sarah Young and Beth Moore. And Sarah Young says, I knew that God com communicated with me through the Bible, but I yearned for more. She's not content with the Bible. Now, when there was such an outcry against this opening statement in her book when it first came out, they later, in the later versions, took it out. Not that she's changed. She didn't repent of this. I yearned for more. I wanted to hear what God had to say to me personally on a given day. Okay, to do that, all you do is you open your Bible and you say, thank you, Holy Spirit, for writing this and preserving this, and now, Holy Spirit, take it out of the, out of the, out of the print and off the pages and into my heart. I'm saying yes to Jesus for whatever you tell me, because you're speaking to me. And if I want to audibly hear you speak to me, I'll put on a tape and let somebody read it, or I'll read it out loud to myself. I'm not trying to be cute. Beth Moore says, I see God doing something in the body of Christ. Something that God showed me on my back porch. He speaks to me very often, putting pictures in my mind. What was it that God told her and showed her to tell to the world? She puts all these people on stage and say, here's a Methodist and here's a Baptist and here's a Pentecostal and here's a Roman Catholic and we're all one body and the gospel really doesn't matter. If you know anything about reality, you know that the Roman Catholicism teaches a salvation by works, and you can't get to Jesus except through the Pope, through Mary. And here is a Southern Baptist woman standing in pulpits all across America, exalting her word that God gave her over the written word of God. So when we say God is speaking, don't confuse it with any of that. We're talking about God speaking through his word. Anything that I say, measure it by the word. If it doesn't square with the word, don't believe it. God is sovereign, he's Lord, he's committed to do all of his good pleasure, not mine. He's carrying out his agenda, not ours. This is his world, not ours. And we find all of this in the word of God. And those who name Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, they've been bought by the precious blood of Christ. These are the people to whom this strong letter is written. Very direct, no uncertain terms. He tells us what he likes what he doesn't like, what he will tolerate, what he will not tolerate. He says, repent or else. Now with that in mind, I want you to suppose something. We're going we're gonna to change horses, but I want to illustrate something. You're sitting in Third Baptist Church of Gallatin. And the elders and deacons have presented to you a man to be the next pastor, Pastor Jones. I'm Pastor Jones. You're meeting me for the first time. And, you know, they served as a pastor search committee, and they're all excited about presenting Pastor Jones and introduces Pastor Jones. And so I'm standing here to preach what has traditionally been called my trial sermon. <laughs> sermon in view of a call. Everything hangs on the balance of this sermon. You're either going to do this when I get through, or you're going to do this. Based on all that's been said, but primarily... This sermon is going to make it or break it. So, 
Pastor Jones says, I'm honored to stand before you. It's always a privilege to preach the Word of God. And I must tell you that my primary goal this morning is to please God. And I have a strong desire that this sermon be relevant to you. And so I've done some research on this church. Now, what I'm going to say next is about Third Baptist Church. I'm not necessarily making this as, in fact, that some of these things are not true about this church. This church. It's true about Third Baptist Church, wherever that is. And for right now, you're in Third Baptist Church. So, I've researched the history and the present state of Third Baptist Church. And folks, I found a lot of good things. I, I realize you live in an area where there's a lot of anti-Christian environment, and, but you've manifested great faithfulness and love for the Lord, and, and I commend you. But I've also found some things that deeply concern me. You allow men of this church, even leaders, to have membership in the local Masonic Lodge who worships a false god, and you've done nothing about it. You have some men and youth in this church who are practicing various forms of sexual immorality. And like the church at Corinth, you've done nothing about it. You have a few men and women who are in open resentment and bitterness toward each other. And you're not dealing with these matters. Some of you are using video material in your Sunday school classes by people who don't even believe the gospel. I plead with you to repent and to return to your first love and to stand on the truth of God's word. Now, hold everything. Question. Third Baptist Church, will you issue a call to Pastor Jones? Yes. Well, I think Southside Baptist Church would. That's my opinion. But in most Baptist churches, first of all, there is no Pastor Jones. I remember on vacation down in Georgia many years ago, we walked into a church and it just so happened that the man was introduced and he was preaching his trial sermon. Oh man, that thing was full of sugar. <laughs> Wouldn't have offended anybody on the world. He was trying to get a position. prophets of the Old Testament, the Apostle Paul, the letters of Jesus are clear and direct and applicable to what is really at hand. And these letters that we're looking at are written to the messenger of the churches, directly to the pastor, and the pastor is not called to be a person or people pleaser. He is to deliver God's message. He is to speak, thus saith the Lord, not his own vision. And I trust that that's why we're gathered at Southside Baptist Church. With our Bibles open to receive the Word of God given to Thyatira, given to all the churches, let him that uh, has ear hear what the Spirit says to the churches, we're included, and therefore to Southside. And so in verse 18, it says to the angel of the church or to the messenger of the church at Thyatira, right? These things says the Son of God who has eyes like a flame of fire and his feet like fine brass. And so this is how Jesus is presenting himself to us this morning. He is the Son of God, which means he's God. He's deity. And when we worship Jesus as the Son of God, we're worshiping God. It is God himself who is speaking to his church. Jesus is God, eternal with the Father. And this morning he's speaking to you and I. And he's got eyes like a flame of fire. He sees all, he knows all, in the works of our hand, and the motives of our heart, the thoughts of our heart. He comes 
and he commends the things that he's seen that are good. He's not out to get you this morning. You may have had great failure in some areas of your life this week, and yet you have held fast to others. He doesn't say, well, I know you did this, but that doesn't count for anything because I'm focused on this. He's focused on all of it. Hold fast to that which is good, that which you're doing right, but there are some things that are destroying you. I want you to deal with them. So he comes with eyes ablaze in opposition to sin. It's very easy to stand in the pulpits today and speak against sin out there. I can't tell you how many times I've heard people say, America is being destroyed because of what the, the, those nine men did. They took prayer out of the schools. Well, I don't think that was a good thing. But they didn't destroy America. They can't keep you from praying. No one has prohibited prayer in your house. No one has prohibited prayer in the church house. No one has prohibited prayer in the schoolhouse. It just can't be public. But it's easy to talk about the sinners out there. None of these letters talk about the sin of the sinners out there. Jesus, with hours of flame and fire and judgment against sin, is speaking against our sin, yours and mine. And when we open the Word of God, we should expect as 2 Timothy 3, 15 through 17 says, the word of God has been given. It will make you wise unto salvation through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And, is, and is, it is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness that the man of God, that an assembly of believers of God will be thoroughly equipped unto all good works to the glory of God. That's what God is up to. So in verse 19, I know your works, your love, your service, your faith, your patience. And as for your works, the last to be more than the first. Very quickly, here is not what he is saying. He is not saying, I'm commending you for a crowded church calendar. <laughs> no, these were very specific godly things. It was not just religion. They were growing in good works, in loving, serving, faith, patience. This is what he's looking for. And by the way, you can, took, you can look at each one, and I'll make this available for you later, but you can focus on one word or one concept out of each of these letters that God is primarily looking for. The church at Ephesus, obviously, you have abandoned the love that you first had. God's looking for love. Church at Smyrna, do not fear the things that you suffer. Willingness to suffer. That's what God is looking for. The church at Pergamon, you've not, you've not denied my faith. They were living in a time when people were turning aside from the truth. We need to hold fast to the truth. And this letter, you tolerate Jezebel. There's a lack of holiness. God is for holiness in your life and mine. And it goes on. Each one of them, that while there are various things there, but there is a specific emphasis in each one of these letters. Now, just on a practical level, uh, you go through a period of time, and the patriarch of the family dies and is left a will, and everybody gathers. And you might not have paid a lot of attention to some of the other things he said, but you gather for that will. You want to know the last things he said. These are the last things that Jesus said to the church. After he has gone back to heaven, he sent and gave to John and to the churches of the world till he comes back, specific letters. All of God's word is important, but these letters have a super importance to show us what God likes and what he doesn't like and what he himself is like. In verse 20, nevertheless, I have a few things against you because you allow that woman Jezebel, who calls herself a prophetess, to teach and seduce my servants to commit fornication and to eat things sacrificed to, to idols. 
could be talking about literal fornication. There was a lot of sexual immorality in the culture. But the Old Testament is very strong in using the concept of the people of God going a whoring after other gods and committing fornication, that is, committing spiritual adultery. That's all involved, even though I think the emphasis here is upon the lack of morality on a physical plane. Here are some quotes relating to this part. Our Lord is clearly referred to a real person, even though the name Jezebel is likely not her real name, but an allusion to that wicked wife of Ahab mentioned in the Old Testament. When Jezebel married Ahab, king of Israel, she exerted such an evil influence that the entire nation turned to Baal. But how could such a woman come into power at the church at Thyatira? How do people who proclaim things that are so obviously different from God's Word come into power in churches today? Well, in this case, she was a prophetess. And people, men and women, give themselves titles and they have great speaking ability and and they promise salvation in Jesus and heaven and idol worship and friendship with the world and guilt free sex I mean whatever you want some of the followers perhaps sang in the choir maybe preached they probably derided some of the Bible teachers of Thyatira as narrow minded killjoys. That worked in the Old Testament. She had it out for the true prophets of God and the masses of people flocked away, turned away from the true prophets of God. I would just say this. Today, beware of any man or any woman who calls him or herself or who allows themselves to be called a prophet or a prophecies. There, there, is, there is no call for that in the New Testament church order. And especially people who give that name to themselves and present themselves as having a line to God that you don't have. And they write books and talk about what God has told them and they invariably will talk about some secret. They love secrets. And their writings and their television programs will be talking about the secrets that God has revealed. Jesus said, don't let any man call you rabbi. There's a, there's a preacher that goes around the nation. He makes all kinds of prophecies. And even though a lot of his prophecies have already not come true, he just writes another book and keeps on going. And every once in a while, I'll get a new email saying, have you heard what prophet so-and-so has said? No. We have the Word of God that was authored by the Holy Spirit, the written Word of God. And the Holy Spirit lives within us as our master teacher. Even if you have a Bible-believing, Bible-preaching, Christ-loving pastor, while it is good and right for you to benefit from his biblical teaching, he should never be a substitute for you being a student of the Word of God. You have the Holy Spirit, the Master Teacher, living within you. This was written by the Holy Spirit and preserved for you. Get into the Word of God and find out what God is saying directly to you and to the congregation where the Lord has you. Be a Berean. They went home and searched to see if the things that, what's it, Paul? Paul had been preaching? You mean I've got to check Paul? Well, they did. And the Holy Spirit commended them for it. How did she get so much power? Well, perhaps she was related to one of the church leaders. And so we can't touch him or her. Perhaps if we confront him or her, prophet, prophetess, whoever, they'll split the church. Perhaps by tolerating them, they'll eventually go away. 
Perhaps it's a mark of grace and kindness just to allow them, tolerate. And I'm sure that when the conversation came up, there was somebody who stood up and said, the Bible says don't judge. Uh, lots of people wanted to go to St. Jezebel's Church of what's happening now. <laughs> because it was so much fun. And you could believe what you wanted to and you could do what you wanted to. And you could keep your sin and have Jesus in heaven too. And God gave her time to repent of her sexual immorality. And she did not repent. The King James says to repent of her fornication. Indeed, I will cast her into a sick bed, and those who commit adultery with her into great tribulation unless they repent of their deeds. Now again, he's talking to people who are under the umbrella of what is called the church at Thyatira. And I will kill her children with death, and all the churches shall know that I am he who searches the minds and the hearts, and I will give to each one of you according to your works. Notice in verse 21, he says, I gave her time to repent. But God's patience has a limit. If we persist in sin, judgment day will come at last. Her followers still had time to repent, verse 22. But let no one be deceived. No one in the membership of a local church can continue in sin, and especially sexual sin, forever without facing judgment. In this case, the judgment is spelled out. Intensified suffering, verse 22. Some going to die, verse 23. And all the churches shall know that God is serious about dealing with sin in the church. Now, you say... Well, this really uh, confuses me a bit because there are lots of churches who are just as being described there, and I don't see God doing any judgment. Well, that's even more frightening. But it's very understandable why it's not seen. Because, you see, Jesus said in Matthew chapter 15, The disciples say in verse 12, don't you know that the Pharisees are offended? <coughs> don't you know that the Pharisees are offended by what you've been saying? And Jesus said in verse 13, every plant which my father has not planted shall be rooted up. Let them alone. They be blind leaders of the blind, and if the blind lead the blind, both shall fall into the ditch. It is a fearful thing to be in sin and to be left alone. It is a horrible thing to be a parent and not discipline your children. Amen. And not love them and bless them and teach them and train them and discipline them. It is a horrible thing for churches to have members and to leave them alone and just, oh, oh, that's what everybody does. A dear brother that, by the grace of God, we, ca we carried out church discipline in this auditorium. He came to me and sat down in my office. I've been visiting other churches. And I've told him what's going on in my life. He was having a hard affair with a young lady at work, half his age. Came and sat in my office and told me how much he was enjoying it. But he also said, you know, we've been... He had been sitting in an auditorium class we had. We'd gone straight through the Bible that year, and he had read the whole Bible that year. And he said, but these people in these other churches are telling me that you all are being harsh toward me. You're being mean toward me. And that what you're doing, sir, is no different than what a lot of people do. You're welcome here. You know what he said next? He said, I know that they're not telling me the truth. It would not be as soon as we had hoped, but there came a day when he stood before this church later 
a year or so later and said I would be in some gutter today had this church not loved me enough to discipline me and he thanked us those who promote free sex casual sex hooking up sleeping around premarital sex fornication filthy talk pornography prostitution adultery sexual experimentation homosexuality bisexuality and all other forms of sexual sin be sure your sin will find you out you say I don't do any of that I just watch it on my iPhone be sure your sin will find you out Now I say to the rest of you, verse 24, as many as have not known this doctrine, who have not known the depths of Satan, as they say, I will put no other burden on you, but hold fast what you have till I come. So to the faithful at Thessalonica, to the faithful at Southside, hold on. Don't give in. Godliness is often measured by doing what you're supposed to do and what you ought to do even when you feel like giving up. You look around and you don't think a lot of people are walking in step. And you feel alone. And you feel like you just want to join in. He who overcomes, verse 26, and keeps my works to the end, to him will I give power over the nations. He shall rule them with a rod of iron. They shall be dashed into pieces like the potter's vessel, as I have also received from my Father, and I will give him the morning star. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. The church at Thessalonica lived in a wicked world. There are many challenges to being a faithful follower of Jesus Christ there. No one disputes that we live in a wicked world. A sexually saturated society. Why is pornography such a huge success? Because it offers a temporary fix for inner emptiness. You could use that same definition for a ton of sins. Why are they so successful? Why are they so uh, appealing to us? They offer a temporary fix for an inner emptiness but it's only temporary it's a cheap counterfeit though it's very expensive and rest assured there will always be a Jezebel male or female who fits the category of a Jezebel ready to talk to us ready to listen to our problems ready to offer cheap quick solutions and she has a lot of sons and daughters and she'll take your body and your soul and she'll lead you straight to hell We must teach our children the last half of Hebrews 13, 4. And I would suggest use the King James Version. Because the King James Version says, but whoremongers and adulterers, God will judge. You say, oh, that word whoremonger, that's a bad word. Yeah, we need to see it for what it is. God will not tolerate whoremongers. Spiritual whoremongers loving the world. If I love the world, the love of the Father is not in me. I didn't say that. That's the word of God. He will not tolerate churches that excuse it. God takes sin, all sin, and sexual sin seriously. He judges those who practice it. He judges those who promote it. He judges those who tolerate it and laugh at it and make light of it. Oh, gee. That's been awfully narrow. I can't watch any of the late guys. All of their jokes, many of their jokes, will have me laughing about that which is holy. And they're using it in an unholy way. You see, here was a church that just tolerated. It didn't happen overnight. They didn't start out as a church and intend to get the way that they had gotten to the place they had gotten to. Neither have we. What's in your life, what's in my life that God is saying repent or else? 
I said, well, so is there no hope for those who have repeated, repeatedly sinned in the sexual arena? Is there no grace for them? Could Jezebel have been saved? Could such an evil woman have found forgiveness? Look at verse 21. I've given her space to repent, but she repented not. How merciful of God. And if there are any of us here today in the secret of our lives, we're on the Jezebel path. God is saying, repent. How merciful of God. He has given you space to repent. He's given you this day. He's given me this moment to repent. How merciful of God. Do not presume upon the mercies of God. Do not presume, O oh Samson, that you'll be able to get up tomorrow and do as you did yesterday and just slay the enemy because you've got mighty strength. He woke up and did not know that his strength was gone. He'd crossed that unseen line between God's mercy and God's grace. If you knew that you were just one heartbeat away, one step away from crossing that line, would you make another step? We don't know. We're not told. What we are told is right now, repent. Turn back to the Lord. Jezebel's, Thyatira's Jezebel was unwilling and so she found herself left with nothing but judgment. But no matter what the bondage is this morning, if you're willing, you can be changed. You can be cleansed. You can have a new start. Your sins can be washed away by the free grace of God. You may be scarred by wrong choices of the past, even of this week. But if you're willing, flee to Christ. Run to him. Be made clean. But think of it this way. You can have Jezebel or you can have Jesus, but you can't have both. To have Jesus, turn your back on Jezebel and give Jesus your whole heart. He loves sinners. He came from heaven to save sinners. He died on the cross to save sinners. Flee to him. There's no other way. Faithful Christian, hold fast. Hold fast. Compromising church member, you're headed for tribulation. Not the tribulation that's the, public, the, 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 the uh, hatred of the world against Christian, but God bringing pressure on your life. <coughs> he did that trunk current. Some of you weak, some sick, some died. Don't wonder that about somebody else. But if there's undealt sin in your life or mine, God does not play with sin. Being in the church, in the body of Christ, is not a haven and a free pass. Sin's okay. It's not okay. Wow. This letter to the church at Thyatira was strong. And this morning, he gives it to you and I. Because he loves us. Because he wants us in the midst of this putrefying world to shine with the light and life of the gospel. That's our privilege. And so he's against anything that dulls the glow and the image and the light of Jesus. And may we be against what he's against. And for what he's for. I want us to sing as our closing hymn that, that song that, that Cindy was playing, whatever number it is, Come Thy Fount, and, and the one that she was playing. There's two in your hymn book, and Bradley can find the right one. This, this song really touches my heart because the man who wrote this 
was close to the Lord when he wrote this. He turned away. He, he got involved in sin in a very bad way. A very miserable man. He's riding along in a coach of some, some sort. This has been years ago. And my remembrance is that a young lady came in and sat on the other side from him. And she was either humming or singing this song. And she started talking about what a wonderful hymn that was. And had he ever heard it? And the Lord, da Lord's daggers and conviction was all over him. And he said, ma'am, I wrote the song. But I've fallen far away. And my understanding is that he later returned unto the Lord. But you know, he says, Oh, to grace, how great a debtor, daily I'm constrained to be. Let thy grace, Lord, like a fetter, bind my wandering heart to thee. Prone to wander, Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. Here's my heart, oh, take and seal it. Seal it for thy courts above. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. May that be our heart today. Let's sing, sing this unto the Lord. And if there's some commitment or decision you need to make, you want to pray with someone, let's obey the Lord during this time.